So we've come to Thursley Common in Surrey to see a pretty epic bird, a very mysterious little bird. I'm here with my friend Eugene. Hey Eugene. Hi. Who is a birder extraordinaire, a fountain of all knowledge on this little bird. What are we here to look for, Eugene? Uh, we're here to look for uh, Eurasian night jars. Yeah. So night jars are like a heathland specialist and I guess coniferous woodland edge and yeah they're beginning to take over more sort of coniferous wood plantations um, and it's one of the reasons that they've started to increase in numbers once again yeah I think we're this way um, and night jars as the name suggests come out at night so we're gonna go to see if we can see any roosting on the ground they look like dead wood um, they're very very camouflaged um, but the real magic starts happening in the evening and they come out and the males do a kind of display flight, isn't that right? Yeah, the display flight is quite sort of uh, often described like almost like butterfly flight. Yeah. Um, and they also uh, make a sound which is known as churring. Yeah, it's a real kind of, of thing that allows you to them before you see them really because they're, they, you know, they also will camouflage. So. Yeah. Um, so last year I came and Eugene came another time here last year. We both saw them, but they're a pretty bizarre bird. And the churring sound is kind of like weird, otherworldly, a mysterious bird, but it's one that a lot of cultures around the world fear. And there's a lot of myth and kind of ill feeling towards them, isn't there? Yeah, so a lot of this, uh, I mean, it's all told in the, in the Latin name, um, which translates uh, to uh, literally as nanny goat milker or otherwise known as uh, the goat goat sucker goat sucker I've heard of yeah yes why uh, are they thought to be goat suckers so they're called goat suckers because uh, one of the sort of older myths surrounding the night jar is that they used to suckle on um, nanny goat's milk which would then curdle the uh, milk of the goat and then cause that the goats to, to die basically so it was sort of right. uh, I think uh, ill omen from you know farmers and locals who had these goats and they would blame the night jars i guess because they would see them regularly around cattle and things like that they it's were... because they're feeding on there's a stone chat here like did you see them in the oh, yeah. little shrub it's because they're so, feeding yeah. on the insects around the livestock at night isn't it there's a juvenile with male oh yeah You often get dark with warblers nest, don't you? This is perfect habitat for those, isn't it? Yeah. So the other thing, apart from being goat suckers in kind of legend about night jars, is that they caused a disease in cattle, um, which is actually caused by a parasitic warble fly. But they used to see the night jars flying around and catching insects at night around livestock. And they thought that the warble fly disease causing skin lesions on the cattle was due to the night jars biting them, isn't that right? That's correct, yeah. And what was the uh, myth about children or... So the myth was that uh, unbaptized children would take the form of um, night jars until judgment day. Right. So, so another very dark, sort of mysterious, ghostly myth. And there's so many of them. And you know, another, another name for night jar is the corpse bird. Oh, right. So they're quite um, distrusted and ill omen yeah, birds. Yeah, I mean, I think most of, obviously most of these omens and things particularly in you know, uh, the UK and Europe particularly, obviously well uh, disbelieved now. But as, yeah. there are probably places in the world where these omens are still very much adhered to, I imagine, yeah. in, in, in slightly less advanced cultures and slightly more superstitious cultures. Um, there will be, I'm sure there will be certain places that still it's see night jars as these sort of dark creatures of the night. Okay. And they're quite a massive um, family of birds worldwide, aren't they? They are, yeah. Um, how many did I say they were? Was it seven? 
17 or was it no, 17 was it in europe and yeah africa, in, was in, it? Like in east africa alone i think there's something like 17 different species of nightjar right um and the nightjar as we know it um is a sort of afro um eurasian species there but they also have sort of north american yeah equivalent distant, yeah equivalent essentially that's um, with poor wills and all that species. All exactly, species, yeah, yeah. yeah, they've diverged from a, a distant um, common ancestor. ancestor yeah. yeah, yeah. And our species, we only have one species in the UK, yeah. and um, this is the path is we it? might have a look at. Okay. But only one species in the UK, and it um, migrates from Africa each year to breed here, right? It does, yeah, from sub Saharan Africa. Often, I think the ones that we get in the UK are often assumed to have come from like they've through doing geo, you know geotagging and yeah. all that sort of thing um to have come i think from the congo and areas like that but, okay you know so. so similar areas that the cuckoos come from yes absolutely yeah, yeah. cool um, and i think they might do a, what they call a loop migration so they sort of ah. loop around like that. cool all right we're off to go find one hopefully fingers crossed <laughs> So we've just seen two birds that I've never seen in my life before, a red start and a Dartford warbler within, what, a couple of seconds of each other? A couple of seconds of each other. And then only a few minutes ago, woodlark as well. Yeah, three live birds. to see if we can find a roosting one. Needle in a haystack. So night jars are notoriously difficult to see. They're super camouflaged and they look like the forest floor. So they look a little bit like sitting on the floor so really really difficult to pick out especially when you consider what the forest floor looks like Just kind of starting to get a bit dark now and we've just heard Colin the cuckoo and we're gonna head back towards the kind of open heath habitat and see if we can find a male night jar chirring. So we've just heard our first chirring. So we've just heard the night jar starting to chur. Eugene, what's the story with their wing flapping? So wing flapping is something that they do during the breeding season. So yeah. it's, it's not the way that the males attract the females. It's like a display thing. It's like a display thing. So as they fly, they like they clap with their wings together, which makes it sort of okay. And they chur and then clap, or is it like clapping on its own? Um, I, it's, I think it's generally clapping.
two males. They're wing clapping and they're kind of chasing each other around. One of them landed on a branch and gave us a really fantastic view. Um, much, much bigger than I thought they were going to be. Um, quite a big wingspan, Eugene, aren't, haven't they? Yeah, maybe it must be at least almost a couple of feet. Yeah, wingspan. yeah, easily. Yeah. So we're going to uh, wait here and hope that they come in a bit closer. They're calling as well, um, but it's the wing clapping that we're hearing. Yeah, there's two there. just two there. It's like they're chasing each other. So we're hearing them churring now. Really weird kind of bubbly sound. Have a listen. Couldn't have wished for better views of Nightjar just as the light was starting to go. Um, there seems to be two males around, maybe chasing each other off territory. Um, and there's one churring just down here, and a bit of wing clapping, and possibly another one just behind here, us here now. Hopefully we get to see them flying like against the skyline. Just saw a woodcock fly over as well, uh, another typical dusk bird. Listen to that churring right behind us. So close. 